As an example of using the DFT to approximate the Fourier transform, we're going to take a signal that we know precisely so we can compute the Fourier transform in closed form. Here's x of t, and it's a damped sinusoid, basically. We've got two sinusoids, one at 10 radians per second and the other at 12 radians per second for their frequencies. And we're going to multiply that by a decaying exponential, e to the minus t over 10. And this signal will start at 0 and go from there. So that's why we've got the u of t here. Well, you can take the Fourier transform of the signal fairly straightforward using tables and properties and so on. And we obtain that the Fourier transform is given by this expression here on the right side. And we can evaluate this in closed form at any sampling of omega. And therefore, we'll have a benchmark or the truth from which to compare our DFT approximation. So here's the scenarios we're going to consider. As far as our desired parameters, we're going to choose, in one case, the resolution of our DFT approximation to be 2 pi over 5 radians per second. In other words, we want to be able to see details at that level. And if you look at the original signal, the two frequencies here are spaced by 2 radians per second. So 2 pi over 5 is just a little bit more than 1 radian per second. So we should be able to resolve the peaks associated with these two sinusoids at this level of resolution. And we're going to sample omega in frequency at pi over 40 radians per second. Now the second case we're going to consider has higher resolution by a factor of 5. We're going to decrease the resolution to 2 pi divided by 25. So in this case, we're the main lobe width of our window function will be well below the separation of these two sinusoids. We should be able to see them. And we'll sample a little more densely in frequency. We'll sample at pi over 50 radians per second. Now this Fourier transform is not band limited. You can see that as omega gets large that it goes down as 1 over omega. So it never exactly goes to zero. And because we're doing this in the computer, we're using an analytical expression and we're sampling this, we can't really filter it before we sample it. So for our purposes here, we're going to assume that the bandwidth is something on the order of 300 radians per second. Okay, so by the time we get to omega equals 300, we're kind of falling off. And that's a factor of 10 smaller than at omega equals 30 and a factor of 20 smaller than in the vicinity of omega equals 15, which is close to where the interesting parts of the spectrum will look. So we're going to assume that kind of a bandwidth. So the sampling theorem says that we need to choose omega sub s greater than twice the bandwidth of the signal. Now the bandwidth of the signal is 300 radians per second, so that would be 600 radians per second. So we're going to choose a sampling frequency of 200 pi, which is greater than 600 radians per second. And that leads to a sampling interval of 1 one hundredth of a second. Now for our resolution, we have to look at the main lobe width. And we're going to assume a rectangular window here. So the main lobe width is 4 pi over n radians. And that translates to 4 pi over nt radians per second. So in the first case, where our resolution was 2 pi over 5, we can do the math and find out that n has to exceed 1,000 when t is equal to 1 one hundredth. And in the second case, where our resolution is 2 pi over 25, we basically need an n five times as big. Now as far as the frequency sampling goes, in frequency, we want to sample at pi over 40 radians per second or better. and our frequency samples are spaced by 2 pi over capital M times T, where M is the length of our DFT. So solving for M, we obtain that M has to be greater than or equal to 8,000. In the second case, where the frequency sampling is, has to be finer than pi over 50, we see that M has to be greater than or equal to 10,000. So we can compute these in MATLAB and display them. Here's a case where I've shown the Fourier transform in the solid blue curve. And you see that we have a, a peak in the vicinity of 10 radians per second and a peak in the vicinity of 12 radians per second because we had a cosine of 10t and a cosine of 12t. And then we have a 1 over omega type decay away from those peaks. And that's a consequence of the e to the minus 
t over 10 modulating the amplitude of the sinusoids. Now the red stems are the DFT approximation for the case of m equals 8,000 and n equals 1,000. So our resolution in this case was to be better than 2 pi over 5 and uh, you can see that indeed we, which is a little bit greater than one radian per second and you can see that indeed we are able to see the two peaks. The width of these peaks as estimated using the DFT is slightly wider perhaps than the truth and you can see that they're kind of rounded here across the top rather than being pointy and then we have this oscillation here which is due to the side lobes of the rectangular window function and frequency. So if we increase our resolution by choosing a larger n, we should get a better fit. So this plot shows the true Fourier transform and a value of n equal to 5,000, where we're sampling in frequency 10,000 points, which ends up being pi over 50 for our sampling interval. So the n equals 5,000 gave us a resolution of 2 pi over 25. And you can see that the structure is very well resolved in this case. We could sample a bit more densely to, to fill in things, but nevertheless, we, we exactly capture the true Fourier transform. So approximation is fantastic. Before we conclude this example, I want to consider what happens when we window using something other than the rectangular window. Here I'm going to show the result with a Hamming window. Now the width of the main lobe of a Hamming window is twice as wide as that of the rectangular window. So to get the same resolution, we need to double the number of points. So we took n equal 2,000 here. And so this is the resolution pi over 5 case. This approximation doesn't follow the true Fourier transform near as well as the rectangular window approximation. And that's in part because of the, the transient character of the signals involved. We're losing energy when we do the window, and that energy is differentially lost near the beginning. As you can see in this display here, where I'm showing in the top panel the signal that was the sampled signal, and then I'm showing the Hamming window for 2,000 points in the bottom panel. What's happening is a lot of the energy is at the beginning because it starts off as a damped exponential, right? That's the largest amplitude. And then we have this sort of exponential um, decay going on here. The Hamming window selects a part of the signal that emphasizes a part that's much later, and that's going to cause a overall loss of energy. Uh, one has to be careful when using other windows on signals that have this kind of transient character. It's less of an issue if the signal is a bunch of sinusoids that are roughly constant amplitude throughout the whole window or some kind of random signal that's approximately the same energy throughout the whole window. Then one can scale things to recover the original spectrum. But that's much more difficult to do in this particular case because if we scale to recover the correct amplitudes on the sinusoidal components, we're going to find that our decay factor here associated with 1 over omega is not going to be fit as well. So in this case, the rectangular window does provide some advantages over the Hamming window. 